Okay. Um, so, high riders to Rolls Royces, the Timberlake story. Um, this, as Claire said, is um, hopefully the first in a series of talks and walks that we were delivering. Um, and I think Claire has already explained the King Street Heritage Action Zone. So this is a small map of it. You can see that it, um, it although it's called the King Street Zone, it covers King Street, Library Street, and all the other little back streets and alleyways in between. Um, so yeah, our, our part in this, I hope, is to stimulate interest in some of those buildings, some of them that do really need a lift. Um, so if we can make a small contribution to reviving uh, some of those, you know, um, great old buildings, well then, you know, that'll be fantastic. So um, what generated my interest in uh, the Timberlake story? Uh, well, it started off with this building, actually. So this is Wallpaper Supplies. Um, tucked away down Arcade Street. Arcade Street takes its name from Grimes Arcade, um, which is blocked off at the moment, has been for about 20 years, but we're rather hoping that at some stage we can open it up again. So um, uh, people looking at this building might think that it doesn't have any real significance, um, any real historic significance, um, but they'd be wrong. Um, I noticed straight away this cobbled driveway in front of the building, which led, led me to think that it, it you know, probably had a previous life and a previous existence. I was looking through a book um, by Bob um, Blakeman, uh, a Wigan historian uh, from the 1990s, and in the transport section I came across this advert, so an advert for Timberlakes, um, hiring cars, hiring shadowbangs. And now Bob, um, in his book, placed this in Library Street, but I could see straight away, uh, this was our Arcade Street building. So it's unmistakable. You can see the windows match up. Uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but this sort of dentiled ridge across the front of the building is still in place. And of course, this um, cobbled runway uh, driveway was the uh, entrance and exit to the garage. Um, so in this, a uh, building in Arcade Street um, is at least 110 years old um, and, and, you know, at one time had a, um, was a really important building in the town centre. So um, with the help of the archives people, I was able to get a clearer image um, and I could see that it was actually an architect's drawing produced by Ormrod and Pomeroy. Uh, they were a, a Bolton partnership of architects who operated between 1904 and 1913. So that helped me to date this drawing uh, around about 1910. Um, they later became Ormrod, Pomeroy and Foy. And we'll hear a bit more about them later on because they feature a bit later in the story. Um, so uh, they were a well-known architect uh, who designed a number of public buildings and uh, quite a few industrial buildings as well. So this was a, a cutting edge building in its day. It's all steel framed uh, with a concrete floor. Um, and the steel frame allows to have these full height, uh, you know, glass windows where the, uh, the cars could actually be displayed on the first floor. And I found out um, later on that there was actually a lift at the back of the building to transport the vehicles up and down to the first floor. So um, I, I was intrigued, wanted to learn more about the Timberlake story. I fairly quickly uh, discovered that the main character in all this was a chap called Herbert Harold Timberlake, HH, uh, also known as Bert to his friends and family. Now he, he was born in 1870 in Maidenhead in Berkshire, uh, born into a, a family of bicycle makers. So his father Henry, two of his uncles, William and Thomas, uh, were involved in the, in the bicycle business. Um, in fact, his uncle William is only eight years older than, than, um, than, than Bert, and they go on to form a partnership, and they be the, the main people instrumental in bringing the Timberlake uh, brand or name to, uh, to the area, to the northwest. So this is a map of Maidenhead at the time. This is Albert Street here, which is where um, young Bert was born. So this was his childhood home, modest terraced house um, in Maidenhead. Um, so his father had founded something called the Pilot Cycle Company, um, and um, they claimed that it was the oldest cycle factory in the world, established in 1868. So he was making bikes uh, under the name of Timberley um, and using the sort of Pilot brand as well. Um, and these are the kind of bicycles he was making. Um, the proper name for these, the purest name, is Ordinary Bicycles. 
uh, also known as high riders. Um, but I think most people know them as penny farthings. So um, Henry, Bert's father, um, was quite an innovative uh, chap. He had a, a number of patents for various uh, things that he'd invented connected with the, with the bicycles. Um, so it started off on a modest scale. He was only employing two or three people, uh, but, but business grew. And by 18, 1880, he'd been bought out by a company called Hickling and Company. Um, now, I know penny farthings look quite primitive to us these days, but um, they were considered a big advance at the time. This is what, uh, what they replaced. So this is um, what's known as a bone shaker. And this is actually a picture of a bone shaker that was made in Wigan uh, in 1864. So bone shakers, I think, for an obvious reason, because they had these very hard, uh, you know, solid uh, rimmed wheels. So the penny farthing uh, at the time was considered a major advance. Um, and they did have advantages. The very large front wheel meant that you could, you know, ride over lumps and bumps a little bit more easily. And obviously you could get up some speed, you know, one turn of the pedals and you've already traveled some distance. Obviously, though, they had disadvantages. You know, you're riding around at sort of head and shoulder height, uh, starting and stopping them getting on and off uh, was, in a, you know, an acquired art. Uh, and if you, something did go wrong, well, then, you know, you had a long way to fall, as this um, unfortunate chap here is demonstrating. Fortunately, he had a crash helmet on, so I don't think he was uh, too badly hurt. So Henry's company um, put their money into something called the Dwarf Ordinary Safety Bicycle. So this was, um, you know, meant to be an improvement on the penny farthing. Uh, and this is a Dwarf Ordinary. So you can see it's got um, gears and chains um, attached to the pedals. So you can, um, you can pedal at the same speed as a penny farthing, but with a smaller wheel. Um, and with a smaller wheel, the clear advantage is you're actually a lot nearer to the ground. So hence, um, you know, it was called a safety bicycle. Um, obviously, you've still got your feet either side of the front wheel. So it's, as this chap's demonstrating, it's quite hard to actually ride it in a straight line because, you know, you're pushing down on the pedals on either side of the front wheel um, as you ride. So at the end of the day, it was a major advance, but, um, you know, they hadn't really thought outside the box. It was basically a shrunken down penny farthing. But somebody who did think outside the box was um, a chap called John Kemp Starley. And it, he invented the, uh, what was called the, the safety bicycle in 1885. Uh, he worked for Rover, uh, would obviously go on to become a car producing company uh, based in Coventry. So this is recognizable, I think, isn't it, as the, you know, the, 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 the bicycle we use now. So rear wheel drive, feet near the floor, and you no longer have to put your, you know, your feet either side of the wheel. Um, so, you know, clearly a lot safer. So Henry's company had, uh, you know, backed the wrong horse or backed the wrong bicycle, I guess, to be more precise. Uh, and the company closed down in 1900. Um, um, Henry carried on making bikes for other people and his brother Tom carried on using the Timberlake name and continued to make bicycles in Maidenhead until uh, the beginning of World War I. So another game changer at this time was an invention by this chap, John Boyd Dunlop of Belfast, uh, invented uh, the pneumatic tyre in 1888. Um, so with, um, you know, the safety bicycle fitted with pneumatic tyres, cycling really took off um, and, you know, they became um, what, what, was, what was described as a cycling craze towards the end of the 1800s. So uh, young Bert and, you know, his uncle William were in a good position to sort of make the most of this. So Bert was obviously growing up while all this was happening around him. Um, he was learning the trade in his father's workshop. Uh, became a keen rider and actually an, uh, an accomplished racer. I found lots of newspaper accounts of him winning races, cycling for Maidenhead, Wanderers Cycling Club, cycling club later on uh, cycling for Oxford Cycling Club. Um, and yeah, he was quite a, a celebrity on the cycling scene. So by the um, end of the 1880s, William and young Bert were in Derbyshire, um, Bert was entering uh, cycling races in the area. Um, they were both members uh, of the committee of the National Cycling Union. That was the body that was overseeing cycle racing at the time. Um, and Bert um, found reports of Bert racing for the Buxton Cycling Club. Also found a reference to him joining the Derbyshire Volunteer Battalion in 1890. Um, so I guess he was fairly settled in the area. 
But they were also looking across to Lancashire to try and open up some depots, as they call them, over here. And by 1891, William had moved to Southport. Uh, he'd set up a bicycle shop on Neville Street, 35 Neville Street, and uh, he lived above it. And Bert had settled in Wigan and started selling cycles in Wigan in 1891. And while he was in Buxton, he met uh, a woman called Florence Charlotte Newbold. She was the daughter of a guest house keeper. So I guess uh, Bert was staying in the guest house and uh, met and fell in love with the, um, with the landlady's daughter. So they were married in Buxton in 1892, um, came back to Wigan, set up home here. Um, and not long afterwards, young Herbert Henry Frederick Newbold Timberlake was born uh, in December 1892, and he would actually be their only child. So we now have two HHs, two Berts, Bert Senior and Bert Junior. Um, I found this um, photograph of Buxton Town Centre uh, and saw the name Newbold. Uh, and a little bit of research told me that this was actually uh, Florence's brother, Henry Newbold, who um, was a successful drapier in the town. So uh, Bert's um, brother-in-law was also a successful businessman. So they set, set up home in Wigan. This was the first Marital Home Two Park Crescent, um, not far from Mains Park and the cricket ground. And the first evidence of um, bikes being sold by Timberlakes in Wigan is on this, um, this photograph from Marketplace in 1890. So you'll notice here Timberlake um, bikes for sale. Oh, sorry, Timberlakes for bikes. So um, he'd actually opened a bicycle shop at 28 King Street. This is a map of King Street at the time. Uh, and this is where number 28 was. This was the shop front here. And you can see it's a long, narrow shop unit uh, with quite a bit of space at the back that was used for uh, assembling and maintaining the bicycles. So this building here is actually uh, the Victoria building. Um, and you can see, you know, he had a, a large sort of ground floor unit. You can see Library Street hasn't been built yet, but we, you know, built through here between 1890 and, um, and 1910. So this is what the shop looked like. Uh, Timberlakes, manufacturers of bicycles, tricycles, bassinets and mail carts, um, selling the celebrated Timberlake bikes or bicycles. So this is the inside of the shop. I'm sorry, it's a bit grainy, but you can see it goes a long way back. So it goes the full depth of the Victoria building. So you can see lots of safety bikes with pneumatic tires on for sale here. Um, I don't know if you can see this here. And I thought this was a, a penny farthing when I first saw it. A uh, closer inspection, I could see it was actually a baby's pram um, or a bassinet, as it was known in those days. So this is a picture from their fitting uh, shop in Wigan, um, which I, I'm not sure if this was at the back of Victoria Buildings or it might be the works, the new works that they opened in 1895 that I'll come back to. So just to get your bearings, this is where uh, 28 King Street would be now. 28 King Street's a little bit further up the street because um, the shops and houses have been renumbered. Um, but this is the Victoria Buildings built in 1877. And this is where 28 was at the time. This is where Timberlake started out with his bike shop. So you can see it's now the entrance to the Evolution nightclub. So uh, business grew quickly uh, by... Um, Late, later on in the 1890s, they had a range of depots across the northwest. So in Wigan, Liverpool, Southport, Ormskirk, Blackpool, Derby. Uh, this one here um, is, the, um, is the shop on Neville Street that William was living above. And uh, this row of shops is still there. And it, these um, sort of pillars, some of the shops still have these pillars outside them. So if you're visiting Southport, it's on that Neville Street, that wide road that links uh, Lord Street to the promenade. Um, so um, in 1894, it had become a limited company um, and William was also lo looking for other opportunities. He set up another company called the Wigan Trotting and Athletic Grounds Company, obviously with a view to, um, you know, generate an interest in athletics and cycling in the town. Um, and there was a shares issue for both companies in 1896 trying to raise capital. Uh, the prospectus for the bicycle company said that their business had almost doubled the previous year. They were looking to raise £75,000 uh, in £1 ordinary shares, which uh, was a little bit ambitious, I think, to say the least. And by this time, uh, William uh, was having a, had a growing family and he'd moved to a larger house in Southport um, in Hampton Road. So um, the 
trotting an athletic company um was creating a, a sports ground that would become springfield park uh, william had um put up over 2700 pounds and his fellow investors um between them had um contributed 16000 pounds to actually develop and create the ground uh, there were also ambitious plans for um tennis courts bowling greens various pavilions uh, but not all of those were realized and this is a picture of the turning of the first sod ceremony uh, 20th of january 1897 and um, so this is william here at the center with the spade uh, spade in hand these are his fellow investors um not you know fabulously wealthy men i think um two of them were in the the the, uh, the butchering trade uh, one was a, a boot manufacturer i think another a pawnbroker but unfortunately it would end badly for them um because um the 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 um the venture wasn't a, a particular success these spades by the way um ron hunt who many of you will know uh, tells me that a family member has actually still got one of these spades that was uh you know they were specially inscribed for the uh for the ceremony so they did um the the springfield park was created you see you know this is what it looked like at the time there was a, a running track a cycling track and a trotting track around the outside and you can see you know from these photos that um it was used um but unfortunately it wasn't a success uh for a whole myriad of reasons um there, there, were, there were disputes with the builder over the quality of the cycle track um i don't think they raised enough capital to build everything they wanted to build so it, you know it probably didn't attract enough events and enough people so the company actually went bankrupt in uh, january 1901 did go on of course to be used to become um, Wigan Athletics home ground and I believe it was used for at least a season uh, by Wigan uh, Rugby League in 1901 to 02 before they moved to Central Park but I think uh, this this um, failed venture is probably why uh, William moved away from the area because by 1901 um, he was back in Derbyshire and he would later settle back in, down in the southeast um, he continued to sell bikes and cars uh died in essex in 1940 age 78 uh, he left behind six children i think most of his children were actually born in southport um but um bert or hh -H stayed in wigan and he continued to develop the business so this was the uh, grand plan for the new works they wanted to build um but i, I suspect they didn't uh, raise enough money um because um there's no evidence that anything on this scale was actually built uh, they did open new works at bradford place off chapel lane um in 1895 and start making bicycles there um, and then um hh would go on to start selling motorbikes and uh, and then start selling cars there was talk at one stage about them actually manufacturing cars in this building uh, but like I say, I found no evidence that a building on this scale was constructed or um, that they did manufacture cars. This is the rough location of the factory. Um, but this was pictured in um, 1938, I think, when the Eclipse uh, Preserves Works had uh, occupied most of the site. So it's difficult to pick out where this, this sort of, um, you know, this grand building would have fitted in here. Um, so I suspect the works were, were built on a more modest scale. So anyway, 1902, um, they start selling cars. Um, they become agents for Humber, De Dion, uh, and Minerva. Um, and the first car they sell is actually a Humber. Um, Humbers at the time um, were made, could claim to be made by royal appointment, as apparently Edward VII and his son, uh, Prince of Wales, who would become George V, uh, both owned Humbers. So um, young, well, old Bert, or HH, uh, appears in the 1904 Who's Who of Motoring. Um, obviously, there weren't that many motorists at, at the time, so it was possible to sort of list them all, I guess, in a who's who. Um, but yeah, I described him as being an experienced driver, having driven over 30,000 miles. And he was the current owner of a Cotero, another French car, um, which would have looked something like this. Commented in the article that... Um, it was a very reliable car and that he'd driven Lord Lindsay around his constituency during the recent by-election without any problems or breakdowns whatsoever. So this was a reference to um, the 1903 Chorley by-election. Lord Lindsay 
um, of Hay Hall. And, um, he was already the MP for Chorley, but he'd been appointed as a cabinet minister. And in those days, um, if you were appointed it to the cabinet, you had to stand for re-election. Um, it was considered the potential conflict of interest being in the pay of the crown, um, being a people's representative. Um, so you had to stand for re-election to see if the uh, people still had confidence in you. Um, so it was a safe, conservative, sort of pretty rural seat at the time, and there wasn't expected to be a, a contest. Uh, but the Liberals put up a candidate uh, only a fortnight before the vote. So there was the, these very hurried hustings. Um, and I've read accounts of um, Lord Lindsay being ferried around to election meetings in places like Tarleton, Croston, Adlington, and obviously Chorley itself. Um, the Liberal candidate won 43% of the vote. Um, so he did give Lindsay a bit of a scare, but Lindsay was re-elected. Um, so I'm sure that, uh, you know, he was grateful to Timberlake for his, uh, his, his help and support. And this is a, a picture of uh, Lord Lindsay, David Lindsay, in a, in a, a motor car um, from around about that time. So he was obviously an early adopter uh, of the motor vehicle. Um, difficult to date this. I mean, I think it's around 1905, 1906. And that's based on the assumption that these are his, uh, his eldest son and eldest daughter, who'd be about five and four at the time. Um, difficult to um, say what make of vehicle it is, but it does look uh, similar to uh, something called a Delage. And uh, Timberlake, we know from this advert, was actually selling Delage cars at the time. So whether Timberlake um, supplied him with this car or not, uh, I don't know. But clearly, they, um, you know, they were they were closely associated. And I think we also know they were both active in the uh, in the Freemasons at the time. So um, this association with the you know, local lords of the manor won't have done his business any harm. So um, we know then that by 1910, he he'd uh, expanded considerably and he'd, he'd built this garage in, uh, in Arcade Street. Uh, and at this time, we know he was, uh, he was running charabangs to Blackpool and Haydock. Uh, and the date of this advert, the newspaper it's from, is from 1910. So we know for a fact this uh, garage was in place by then. Um, he moved house, uh, or he had moved house by 1911. The census shows him now living at 34 Trafalgar Road, um, an Edwardian uh, semi on the other side of uh, Mains Park. And uh, not long after, he would move um, just a few doors up the road to 42 Trafalgar Road, which he'd call Parkdale. And he would actually spend, um, uh, spend the rest of his life living in this house. Um, this was a... a Interesting artifact that the um, that the uh, archives people found for me. This is a, a pocket guide that he produced in 1912. So I think it just demonstrates that he was, um, you know, he's quite innov innovative, always looking for ways to market his business. So this this um, is actually about the size of a mobile phone, but it's got this really high quality map that folds out from the inside. He was selling these at uh, two shillings a time. So um, it contained a, ma a, a map that was based around Wigan. Um, but covered, you know, um, lots of Cheshire, Lancashire, Derbyshire. Uh, around about this time, he was also advertising selling motor bicycles um, and also selling sidecars. So uh, these sidecars, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I'd feel too safe traveling around in one of these strapped to the side of a motorbike. Um, it's, you know, a bit like riding on a, uh, it looks like a bath chair on wheels. Um, I think an attempt to reassure as the advert tells that it's made from the best quality cane. So um, a little bit of a um, sort of negative publicity that I, I came across um, was this case again from round about the time um, and one of Timberlake's charabangs was involved in a fatal accident and there was a cyclist riding from Lytham to, to Preston um, and I guess the Charabang must have been heading in the opposite direction, going to Blackpool. Um, and from the description in the court case, uh, there were two vehicles trying to overtake each other, um, one being the Charabang, another being a car. And the, um, their wheels touched, the Charabang careered off into a ploughed field, but unfortunately it hit a, uh, a cyclist coming in the opposite direction. Um, so Timberlakes were, were, were liable. Uh, and ordered by the court to pay £750 uh, compensation to the widow um, and, and the widow's children. 
So anyway, as World War I uh, approaches, um, uh, Timberlakes are already on to the next big thing that you can see they're selling Ford motor cars. Um, so Henry Ford had uh, pioneered mass production and uh, the assembly line and he built factories already around the world. So this is um, inside the factory that he built at Trafford Park uh, in Manchester, just down the road. Uh, so Timberlake, you can see, is already on the case selling Ford cars, uh, selling a range of them for uh, all for well under £200. Uh, again, uh, 1914, he's also selling Ford vans and bell size vans. Bell size was a local British company made vans also in Manchester. And then again, a sign of innovation um, during the war, 1917, um, he's teaching people to drive, running a motor school. And uh, you'll see here ladies uh, specially catered for. So obviously he's conscious that a lot of the men are away fighting. So he's, uh, he's targeting, uh, you know, teaching women to drive. Also in 1917, during the war, carry on with coal gas. Um, so obviously there's a petrol shortage. So he's offering to convert vans to, uh, to run on coal gas, which involves putting, uh, you know, this large gas container on the top of your van. Uh, this is what they look like in reality. They don't look too safe, but um, you can see this one's been filled up from a, a pipe at the side of the street that's linked up to the town gas system. So uh, on a more serious note, during the war, they uh, use their engineering skills to switch to producing shell casings. So you can see this is a photograph of the um, Timberlake munis munitions staff uh, on the uh, steps in Mains Park. And this here, I believe, is, um, is young H.H. Uh, Youngberg Timberlake. This is a larger picture. It may be from later in the war. They may have ex ex um, extended production. Um, but I believe this to be um, H.H. Senior, you know, and this chap to be H.H. Junior. So um, towards the end of the war, then, there was another addition to the family. H.H. Um, H. Junior had a son, Keith Herbert William Timberley. Uh, he was born in Southport, where young uh, Bert was living by this time. Um, and he would, he would go on to become a director of the company and also uh, the company sales manager. So uh, this switch to munitions during the war emphasised that um, they weren't just car salesmen, you know, they were engineers. Um, and um, Bert Senior was involved uh, with a number of car manufacturing companies. He was a motor factor sourcing and supplying components. Uh, and he was also a director of a number of companies. And um, uh, Bert Junior, after he'd been to Wigan Grammar School and Lancaster College, did an apprenticeship at Bunkle Motors in Southport to also qualify as an engineer. So uh, one of the car companies he was involved in was uh, Westwood Motors. And thanks to Peter Fleetwood for uh, providing this information for me. Um, but this was a fairly short-lived um, Wigan-based car manufacturer. They had a Britannia Works based out at Lower Ince. You can see this is uh, one of the cars they produced with a W on the, um, on the grill. Um, but they, um, they went out of business around 1926. They couldn't really compete you know, with, the, uh, with the likes of Ford and Morris and Austin who were producing cars in high volumes. Uh, he was also um, involved with Page Field. Uh, so these were vehicles manufactured by the uh, Walker Engineering Group, um, who had a, their main um, ironworks were in Pagefield, which is what gave the vehicles their name. So again, he was uh, supplied them with uh, with gearboxes and parts. Um, they lasted a little bit longer than Westwood, and they made uh, mainly commercial vehicles from 1904 through to about 1966. Uh, so you can see they made a range of fairly in innovative vehicles. This one's interesting on the end here. This was made for the Mersey Tunnel Company. Um, and this um, device was for cleaning the inside of the Mersey Tunnel. So this was their, their works at, uh, at Pagefield. So he was also involved with their Vulcan motors. This is a large uh, factory uh, that they had at Crossons in Southport. I don't know if you know that area of Southport, but this is the road that links the um, you know, Churchtown Botanic Gardens to the, um, uh, to, the, to the plough roundabout. But he became a director in 1928 and was credited with um, reorganising the company. Uh, they switched from making cars uh, to making uh, focusing on commercial vehicles. 
Um, and this is where he'd sent uh, Bert Jr. in 1907 to, you know, to learn his trade. And uh, Bert himself became the managing director of, uh, of this company for a short period of time. Um, and um, Bert Sr. was actually the chairman for a while. Uh, another car company, uh, another iconic British car company that he was a uh, director of and one time chair was Lee and Francis, a uh, Coventry based car manufacturer uh, who were a sister company to Vulcans. They shared dealerships, um, shared components, uh, and they carried on making these, you know, beautiful cars through till 1962. And these are now, you know, prize collector's items. This, this one here, this pink one is uh, the Lynx, which was one of the last cars they, they made. So um, by the um, mid to late 20s, then, you know, business was booming. Um, um, Bert Senior features in this um, story in the Wigan Examiner. They're doing a, a series on local celebrities. Uh, so it describes him as uh, having contented and loyal staff, a man of simple tastes, uh, photography being his only hobby. Uh, and it also praised him for regenerating the town. Uh, and I think if you look at, compare some of the maps from the early 1900s to the 1920s, you can see the impact he made in this, in this area, this area that's now, you know, largely part of the um, heritage action zone. So you can see this is where he started his shop on King Street, but you can see there's a big vacant plot here opposite the college, uh, more empty plots here on Library Street. And um, there's a gap here on Arcade Street where his, um, you know, where his garage would be built. If you look at this map from um, the late 20s, then you can see he's built his garage here in 1910. He's built this huge three-story um, showroom and garage here opposite the college. He's built another showroom here on Library Street, and he'll also fill in this gap by building yet another showroom. Um, so you can see the same from aerial photos. This is from 1920. You can see there's the college and you can see there's this big empty plot across the road. And similarly, there's you know, this empty plot here in Library Street. And by 1938, you can see he's built this uh, impressive showroom on one side of Library Street, another one directly opposite. He's built this uh, huge three-storey showroom and garage uh, directly opposite the college is obviously now the town hall and this is his original garage here the first building we looked at built in 1910 you can see this curved fascia here this is where the uh, you know the uh, bore the timberlake name he'd also acquire these two buildings here as well college chambers and this uh, corn merchants building on arcade street so eventually he owned this whole block and he actually put a roof across this section here um, so that it was all one large um, joined up complex. So um, this is a, a guide published in 1937. Um, it's a, a sort of car touring guide, but it's got a lot of information in about um, the company and what it was like at the time. Uh, all, and it's also got some great pictures of his showrooms that I'll come to. Uh, but thanks to Ron Hunt, who uh, dug this out from his, uh, his personal archives, and let me scan some images from it. So this is the um, number one showroom, as it was called, built in 1922. So this was designed by Ormrod Pom Pomeroy and Foy of Bolton. So the same company that designed the, the 1910 garage on Arcade Street. Um, and this is really is a high quality building. Um, so all of these features around the windows, these are solid Portland stone, uh, red Accrington brick. Um, you see um, Westmoreland slate on the roof and you see even stained glass windows in these, uh, these roof windows. Um, this was the biggest uh, piece of work that the architect did and you see there's some similarities. This is Tillerton's huge uh, printing works and packaging works in Liverpool. Uh, but you can see it's got the same Portland stone features, um, you know, Accrington brick. Uh, and if you actually take a close look, you can see this is a, a detail from the uh, Tillotson's building. Uh, and this is the same sort of architectural detail from the Timberlake building. So clear, you know, the, it was um, designed by a quality architect. Um, this is showroom number two then. So this is the, um, you know, the big, um, huge three-story building built around 1927. Uh, and if you look, it sort of replicates the same look as as, um, as this building, doesn't it? It's got the same sort of uh, roof and the same sort of roof windows. 
Um, but you can see this is um, steel framed, like the like the garage on Arcade Street. Um, so uh, that allows it to have these huge, uh, you know, windows at the front. Um, obviously, windows at the side as well, and there were windows all along the back of the first floor. So the the showrooms were flooded with light. So this is the entrance here to take vehicles into the ground floor. Entrance here into a lift. You can see the top of the lift shaft up here. So this lift carried vehicles up to be displayed on the first floor in the showroom, uh, but it also carried vehicles up to the top floor uh, because incredibly there was a, a fully functioning garage on the top floor where cars were serviced, repairs, and where there was a paint shop. And this was uh, showroom number three, directly opposite showroom number one. So this is where they uh, sold um, tires, parts, accessories and motorbikes. Um, and it came across another uh, slightly um, negative news story uh, connected with this um, with this um, depot. The manager of it um, was taken to court in the 30s for um, allegedly um siphoning off parts and tires over a long period of several years and selling them on to people who uh you know who, who sold them on for him um the courthouse at the time was described as looking like a looking like a garage because they assembled all of the exhibits uh so the, apparently the corridors of the courtrooms were um were, were, you know were stacked up with tires and other other accessories that had been uh, brought along to uh, as exhibits in the case I'm not sure whether um, I couldn't find out whether um, the, you know the the unfortunate chap was found guilty or not. So um, uh, he, he, well, you never know; he may have uh, he may have um, been innocent. This is another picture from the uh, 1930s that the archive uh, staff found for me. So this is a very happy looking chap on a on a gleaming new Norton bike outside um, showroom number three. So you can see in showroom number one across the road in the background. Um, so obviously this uh, well before you needed to wear a crash helmet. Uh, this is another um, artifact from the 30s. Um, convertible Rolls Royce sold by Bonhams in 2005 for £26,000. Um, and um, the first owner was H.H. H. Timberley. So I would imagine this possibly belonged to H.H. H. Jr. Um, but and maybe he may have used it to um, commute across from Southport. Um, as the um, 30s came to an end then, um, World War II approached. Um, and at the start of World War II, the 1939 register shows that um, Bert Jr. is now 47, living in Southport. Uh, and he uh, also records that he joined the ARP, so he was doing his bit as, as a warden. Um, unfortunately, uh, Bert Senior doesn't live out uh, to see the end of the war, uh, dies aged 73 in 1944 uh, and is buried uh, in Christchurch on Parbold Hill. Um, Florence carries on as a director of the company and uh, Bert Junior becomes the managing director uh, and his son Keith is a director and sales manager. Now, um, up until a couple of days ago, it was a mystery of, in terms of what uh, Timberlakes did during World War II. But um, with the help of a friend, Jack Deacon, um, who I didn't know until recently, had served an apprenticeship at Timberlakes during World War II. Started there in 1943, um, but his, his apprenticeship was interrupted because he, uh, he did naval service. Um, but Jack told me that during World War II, um, they'd switched to making shell casings again in the same way that they did during World War I. Um, so he told me that the um, library street premises were actually converted into a machine shop. Also says he remembers Bert, uh, whose distinguishing feature was that he was uh, incredibly well spoken. Um, I think the term Jack used was, he, you know, he's, he was very posh, very far back. Um, Jack also met Florence and um, he told me that she used to arrive in a green Pontiac at Library Street. So um, this is a green Pontiac from the 1940s, so uh, it may have looked something like this. Um, Jack also recalled that um, Timberlake's never been one uh, ones to miss an opportunity, um, acquired lots of um, service vehicles and resprayed them, sold them 
um, to meet the growing demand for cars, uh, particularly from servicemen coming back from the war. Uh, so, uh, like I say, they were always, uh, always ready to make the most of an opportunity. So as we move towards the 50s then, um, Timberlakes are selling uh, mainly uh, British cars. You can see they've slightly rebranded, re adopted this logo, Timberlakes of Wigan. Um, the 50s was a sort of period of consolidation really for the British car industry. So um, I think in 1952, Morris and Austin had merged uh, they were the two big manufacturers, but they'd also absorbed companies like Riley, MG, uh, you know, and several others. Um, so you can see these are the cars that um, the BMC, the British Motoring Corp, British Motor Corporation were making at the time. So the Austin A40, uh, the Woolsey 444, Morris Oxford, and they do all look, you know, quite dated, even though this was uh, this was in the in the 50s. Um, there's also these Austins um, from um, late 40s, early 50s, but uh, this shear line here, there are quite a few of these left driving around when I was uh, when I was growing up. Uh, I think they called them the poor man's Bentley, but they always had this uh, very old fashioned looking sort of square trunk on the back. Um, so um, remember this Austin logo, because we might see something that looks similar, similar to that a little bit later on. So yeah, um, the industry was consolidating. So Van uh, Standard, for example, Standard had, um, would take over Triumph and become Standard Triumph and would eventually become part of British Leyland. Uh, Alvis um, was merged into the Rover Group. Um, the one car on here that looks uh, a little bit modern uh, is this one, the Austin A40, the later Austin A40. And British Motor Corporation brought in a Spanish, uh, Spanish, an Italian stylist um, called Farina. And uh, he came up with this, you know, what was then a very revolutionary design. And uh, the car was really popular, uh, you know, and they sold a lot of them. And some people um, credit this as the, um, you know, the first sort of modern day hatchback. It didn't strictly speaking have a hatchback. It had the shape of one and it, you know you did have this sort of space behind the seat and the seat could be lowered down um so what was happening with the family in um in the 50s well bert jr was now uh, well into his 60s and he'd moved to landudno sort of semi-retired um, his mother uh, florence uh, had been moved into a nursing home near to where he lived and sadly uh, she died in 1954 aged 88 and she'd be buried alongside uh, her husband at uh, Christ Church on Parbold Hill. So as the um, 50s drew to a close then, uh, the Timberlake family's involvement in the company was drawn to a close. In 1959, Hatton's uh, Southport-based um, dealership bought HH Timberlake Limited. They retained the name and ran it as a subsidy, sorry, a subsidiary. Um, so H.H. H. Jr. was now in his late 60s um, and he and his son Keith moved down to Sidmouth in Devon. Um, the Library Street premises were becoming uh, unsuitable for a modern dealership and in 1968 um, Hatton uh, built new premises on Wallgate. So this is a newspaper report, a picture from the inside um, of the, uh, the brand new dealership as it was then. Um, and then rather tragically in the same year, um, Keith Timberlake dies uh, very prematurely at the age of just 49. So his father, um, Bert Jr., actually um, outlives him um, and um, dies age 94 in 1987. So um, throughout the 60s, the uh, Library Street premises uh, still functioned until the, the Wallgate premises were opened. Um, in 1968. So this is a, a picture inside the paint shop. So this is actually up on the, the top floor of that building <coughs> on Library Street. Um, so you can see you've got an Austin A40 here, a Mini uh, Morris 1100, which were incredibly popular. I think they were the best selling, selling car of the 60s. Uh, Triumph Herald, I think, another Mini on the end. So yeah, this um, this garage was um, you know on the top floor of the uh, <clears throat> of the Library Street building. This is another very grainy shot of the um, of the garage as well. You can just see the lift over in the corner there with the shutter closed. Uh, so that's where the um, you know the lift. <clears throat> 
would um, take vehicles up and down to uh, to ground level. The um, showroom number one continued to operate as well during the 60s. You can see from this picture here, this is another shot. Uh, you can see the selling Jaguars and Austin cars, uh, Morris Minor in the window. Uh, this is a great picture from 1968, Jennifer Moss uh, collecting an MG from the, um, from the number one showroom. So uh, of course, Jennifer Moss played Lucille Hewitt in uh, Coronation Street. So the, um, the main premises in Library Street um, were closed in 1968 when the Wallgate uh, dealership was opened. Um, and in 1968, the Liverpool Echo reported that there were plans to demolish it. Um, and that um, a developer wanted to build shops and offices on the site. Also reported the corporation wanted to use some of the land to make a wider road connecting Library Street to King Street. Not sure how they were going to do that without demolishing more buildings. Anyway, the plans uh, didn't go ahead and they didn't materialise and the premises stayed empty for about four years. So you can see it looks quite different to how it looked, um, you know, in the 1930s. So you can see by this time, um, Timberlake's occupied this whole block. And you can see they had all of the uh, shop fronts the full way along and the, the Timberlake sign is being sort of recentered uh, to acknowledge that. You can also see that um, petrol pumps were installed here on the corner. Um, although clearly you couldn't drive through them. You must have had to pull up on the pavement and um, have your car filled up there, something that wouldn't pass a, a risk assessment these days. So um, this advert from the Liverpool Echo in 1977 shows they're still using the HH Timberlake name, uh, you know, even though the dealership is is now um, uh, um, owned by Hattons on, and on um, Wallgate. So you can see they're selling lots of uh, Morris Marinas, Austin Princesses, Triumph Dolomites, uh, the ill-fated TR7. So uh, and you can see... <clears throat> Sorry, you can see they're selling um, Leyland cars by this stage because British Leyland um, became bankrupt in 1975 and, uh, and was nationalised to become Leyland cars. So um, in the late 70s, there's another uh, takeover um, and a company called Baldwin's um, buy out the Wallgate dealership. Um, so this is the chairman here, John Baldwin. Uh, featuring in his own uh, advertisement. So um, he renames the dealership Baldwin Timberlake, so still keen to retain that Timberlake name. Uh, this is an interesting uh, marketing um, uh, occasion. Um, so Baldwin Timberlake look as though they're trying to drive a Triumph Dolomite into the trusty savings bank on King Street. Not quite sure why. I believe it was a uh, the prize in a in a competition. Um, I'm not sure it's going to fit through those doors, but uh, anyway, it had the desired effect and seemed to attract a lot of attention. So this was the dealership um, on Wallgate um, around about 1980. So you can see selling Leyland cars. So <clears throat> Mini Metro here, uh, which was a, a rare success story for British Leyland, um, Austin Princess, Rover 3.5, uh, these were quite successful as well. I think this was car of the year, uh, one year, and I think it was popular with police forces as well. Uh, over here, uh, Triumph Acclaim, which was a um, product, I think, of a um, collaboration between Honda and British Leyland. Basically a Honda with a Triumph badge on, I think. Uh, and unlike a lot of um, British Leyland cars, it was uh, it was quite reliable. So anyway, the inevitable happened. Um, in 1983, after months of speculation, it's announced that um, the Baldwin Timberlake will close, loss of 43 jobs. So um, John Baldwin, the owner, blames the recession. Roger Stott, who many of you will remember, the local MP, in the same article, blames the uh, Margaret Thatcher's government. So whatever the reason, um, you know, this marked the end of the use of the Timberlake name uh, to sell vehicles in the area. So uh, British Leyland or Leyland uh, would be trimmed down, uh, would become the Rover Group a few years later, uh, bought by BMW in 1994 and then went into administration in 2005. So what happened to the uh, Timberlake buildings then? Um, 
Well, um, this newspaper article from 1973 is speculating that uh, the main building on Library Street is going to become a big shop, uh, quote unquote. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Cohen brothers uh, owned a chain of wallpaper and DIY shops, um, bought it, uh, and it became wallpaper supplies. Um, in 1984, um, for whatever reason, the Coens were looking to sell some of their branches. They sold the Wigan branch to Max Braycheck, um, and Max passed it on to his son, who's the current owner, Chris Braycheck. Um, I'll come back to Chris later because um, Chris gave me access to the inside of um, of the um, you know the old Timberlake's complex that is now Wallpaper Supply. So. Um, I'll be able to share some photographs um, shortly. So just to recap then, what happened to the other buildings? Well, this, uh, we've already said that the um, the bicycle shop on King Street is now uh, the entrance to the Evolution Club. Um, showroom number one um, became a carpet bed um, and bedroom furniture showroom. And you can see when it was up for sale in 2014 and the um, and the fascia was removed that the original Timberlake sign was still there underneath intact. Um, it was then taken over by Elaine Stewart, uh, hairdressers. And Elaine, I think, has done a great job of renovating and maintaining this shop front. Um, in fact, I know uh, Elaine is fully aware of the history of the building and, um, you know, takes it very seriously. I believe this... Um, frontage here has been placed very carefully above the old Timberlake sign that's been retained uh, intact uh, beneath. I also believe Elaine's um, brother worked for Timberlake, so she, um, you know, she's got a good understanding of the history of the of the building. Um, uh, her daughter uh, Kay let me take some photos um, the other day, so you can see lots of the original features still still there. Uh, you know, the sort of combing inside. Um, these features outside, solid granite, um, sort of plinth to the uh, shop front. These this mosaic decoration still original, still in place. And you can see these sort of uh, Art Deco decorations as well around the doors. Uh, the building across the road then, showroom number three as it was, um, has been altered. You can see it's lost the, um, it did have a, a, a stone parapet that's gone, it's been rendered over, currently occupied by intro recruitment uh, and up for sale as of 2021. So the rest of the uh, complex then, um, that is now wallpaper supplies is, is also, you know, more or less intact. Um, so this is the large um, three-storey um, showroom come garage and you can see the lift shaft uh, is still there, still evidence on the roof. Uh, this is the 1910 garage, the first building that we looked at. And you can see the, uh, the there's all, another lift shaft there that carried um, cars and vehicles up onto the first floor display area. Um, so yeah, um, College Chambers is now part of, um, became part of Timberlakes and is now part of Wallpaper Supplies. Uh, as is this um, old corn merchants building here on Arcade Street. Um, so yeah, like I say, um, uh, Chris uh, allowed me in to have a look around, gave me a guided tour. And there are some, um, you know, some features. I took lots of photographs, but I'll just share one or, one or two of them. So uh, inside um, our 1910 garage, um, this may sound a bit anorakish, but um, this is um, this is the lift mechanism in the roof space above where the lift wants to carry the cars up uh, from the ground floor to put them into that first floor display window. So this is over 110 years old. Uh, so you can see these uh, lift uh, wheels here and these pulleys. You can still see some of the um, the metal. Uh, cables attached lift um you know obviously isn't isn't used now um and the space of the lift shaft's been used for other things um chris has been um removing some of the old um, pegboard from that first floor um showroom as well and it's revealed some of the old um, original paintwork and when he pulled um one uh, bit of peg pegboard away it revealed this um um a 70 or 80 year old um austin sign so this is a priceless little bit of motoring and sort of local history 
Um, yeah, I also managed to have a look around the, you know, the main building. Obviously, there are lots of independent shops now that occupy the front, um, which, uh, you know, Chris has set up. Um, but there are still some original features. So this is the entrance to the lift shaft in uh, College Avenue. You can see the uh, top of the lift shaft is still there on the top of the building. Um, inside that shutter then, the old um, 1920s wooden door is still there, uh, still intact. You can see this, some of the sort of massive steel infrastructure here. Um, and this is the stairway up, um, the back stairway up to, um, to the floors above. This is looking up on the right hand side, this is looking up this huge lift shaft that carried cars and vans, uh, you know, up to the first floor to, for display and up to the top floor for, uh, for the garage. This is looking across the lift shaft from the third floor and that gives you an idea of the scale of it. Some of the old, uh, the shuttering from, from the lift is still there as well, although it hasn't been used for a long time. This is up in that top floor where we saw the paint shop before. Um, so you can see this is where the lift used to be, where we saw that lift shutter in the 1964 picture. Chris uses this area now for uh, maintenance and, um, and repairs. This is on the first floor, again, give you an idea of the uh, the scale of the steelwork, because there isn't a single pillar on the first um, or ground floor. Obviously, if you were using this as a car showroom, um, you know, you want to avoid, uh, you know, having to drive around pillars. So all of the all of the load of the concrete floors is borne by the, uh, you know, by the by the steel framework around the sides of the building and by these huge uh, steel joists. These are the original windows as well that have been painted out uh, because the outside of the building was reclad. So another example of the interior steel work in this uh, this hoist. And this is up on the uh, top floor, looking across to the town hall. So you can see it was originally uh, timber lined on the top floor. Um, also, I had a chance to look inside uh, College Chambers, uh, built in 1901. Um, so late Victorian, early Edwardian building, but um, lots of uh, original features in there. Um, fireplaces, corniches, these are more or less floor to ceiling sort of bay windows with all the original sashes still intact. Um, couldn't show photographs of the inside because they are being used as, uh, as offices, some of them at the moment. And uh, the Timberlake's canteen was up in this top floor uh, in the 60s. And the, um, the archive staff found this picture uh, for me. So this is looking out of the Timberlake's canteen window in the 1960s, looking across Arcade Street. You can see Grimes Arcade here. Um, and you can see this timber structure here that's been demolished now. Uh, Chris tells me it was a garage um, and the ownership of it was disputed when his dad took over. Um, but apparently it, um, it was deemed to belong to the Meeks building uh, rather than to um, Timberlake's. I tried to replicate the picture and um, failed miserably, managed to get a picture of a very large um, television aerial, but hopefully you can get the gist of it. So um, I also saw inside the um, the warehouse, um, the old um, corn merchants, the ground floor had been knocked through to make the garage larger, probably back in the 20s or 30s, but um, the upper rooms are still intact. So again, lots of original features up here. So this wood panelling and glass panelling uh, all looks original, as do the sash windows. Uh, you can see the original roof beams are there and these very old Victorian sinks. And this sort of panelled area here, which looks as though it might have been an office at one time. Uh, and this is the, um, the top floor uh, warehouse doors. There was, used to be a hoist over here to um, move shift goods up and down to the street. So I couldn't help thinking walking around here that um, if old Bert Timberlake had been alive and, uh, you know, coming around with us, that he, he would still recognise some of the uh, features from the, you know, the empire that he built over, over all those decades. And that concludes the Timberlake story. Thank you for watching.